Good. So welcome everyone again to the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics lecture series. Before I start, I just want to point out again, we do have a problem set and you can just go to the website to see these three problems uh, and you should still try them out because on Wednesday evening, we will have a little tutorial session uh, to discuss these problems. That will be at uh, 6 p.m. So uh, same time as today, only on Wednesday this week. Um, so the Google link will be put up on the website and the tutorial will be uh, delivered by Michael Zwerger, uh, one of my postdocs. Fine, so let's get started. We're just uh, discussing experimental implementations of uh, Bell tests. And uh, I want to start with a small recap of what we discussed at the end of last time. We pointed out that there are, of course, very important conditions that go into the proof of Bell for which correlations should be observable in an experiment uh, when it is described by local hidden variable theories. And one very important condition, of course, was locality. And what this means in practice is that you should not have no way of a light signal reaching the other detector in time for the measurement that is carried out there to reveal the detector setting at the present detector. So nothing should go from A to B in time to affect the measurement. Um, so anything that um, would be available here namely the information about the detector setting, uh, can only be known to anyone within this light cone. So at all these events, uh, the detector setting can be known, but it should not be known um, during the whole time interval when B carries out the measurement, including the end of the measurement that I circled. So that's one thing, no signals going from A to B. And then we discussed another very important feature, which is of course detection efficiency. So if you have a very small detection efficiency, then nominally in the correlators you evaluate in principle, uh, many times the outcome would be zero, which reduces the value of the correlator. And so it becomes easier and easier, even if in principle quantum mechanics underlies your experiment, it becomes easier and easier that the left-hand side of the Bell inequality is in fact uh, smaller than the right-hand side. And so it would look like it, as if it could have been a local hidden variable theory. So that's not nice. So you want to have good detectors. If you don't have good detectors, then uh, what you can still do is proceed as you would normally do in any standard experiment. Namely, you say, oh, let me calibrate my apparatus. I know I have a bad detector efficiency. And then let me just, um, back out the true uh, probabilities, for example, that I would have observed if it hadn't been for these non-idealities. If you can do that, then of course, you will not be affected anymore by the detector uh, efficiency, and you can then insert these numbers into Bell's inequality and hopefully uh, show a violation. But anyone who clings to the belief that local hidden variable theories should describe the world could then criticize you and tell you that in fact you have not really honestly ruled out local hidden variable theories because you have put in this extra assumption. This kind of extra assumption here is called fair sampling hypothesis, namely that um, the situation is really as described here, you, you have the ideal results and then you just reduce the amount of statistics by the detector efficiency. But things could go very wrong if somehow the uh, statistics of the observed, um, of the observed measurements of the observed particles would be different from the statistics of all the particles. And so that brings us to a general theme. Um, Whenever you have a non-ideal Bell test, for example, bad detectors or not sufficient distance between the stations, measurement taking too long, then you need extra assumptions to interpret the results. And someone who wants to believe in local and variable theories could then point out that 
since you are using these extra assumptions, you're not really applying the original logic of uh, Bell inequalities. And so you're not really ruling out local hidden variable theories. So they could still be true. And therefore these extra assumptions amount to some kind of loophole in your reasoning. So we will encounter this again and again. Okay, so now today I really want to go through the history of actual Bell tests. And one has to understand that the very first Bell tests were very modest in their goals. So the goal was not to implement the idealized scenario that Bell described, including the constraints on locality, but rather just to produce an experiment where you get something like a singlet state, either for photons or for material particles, and you are able to measure the correlations between the spins of the two particles, and you are able to verify that indeed quantum mechanics is correct for these uh, situations. And you have all the kinds of non-idealities, inefficient detectors, and so on. Uh, that's the price you pay. But still, uh, in these early experiments, uh, logically speaking, uh, what you could have observed, it was a possibility that you would observe that quantum mechanics breaks down. That um, even after you take into account all the problems like detector inefficiencies, you have to conclude that quantum mechanics does not properly describe the experiment. So logically speaking, it could have been that uh, you, try to, you try your best to produce a singlet state, but you find that for some fundamental reason, every time you try this, it very quickly decays into some other state. It cannot be uh, kept alive for a sufficient time to measure it. In which case then, uh, of course, maybe the scenario, the idealized scenario that Bell described would not even be possible in nature. And that could in turn mean that local hidden variable theories are a viable description of nature. So all of this was on the table back then, uh, but even these first experiments uh, seem to, uh, seemed to be compatible with quantum mechanics. So we already briefly discussed um, positronium annihilation. This is something where you actually emit uh, entangled photons and then proton-proton scattering, something where if a scattering takes place, you know that you have a certain entangled spin state. But then the first really dedicated and very serious uh, Bell test is due to uh, Friedman and Clauser. And it starts a long line of Bell tests that use the atomic cascade idea, which we discussed already previously. So you have an atom, it decays, and emits two photons in the decay, and the photons will be entangled and can be used for a Bell test. So just briefly, I depict here um, the level scheme of the atom. I don't go into the details. The important thing is that you excite the atom from its ground state to an excited state. It then quickly de decays to a lower level. And then there is a rapid succession of two decays that go via an intermediate state and which emit the two entangled photons. And we looked at this before and we found that uh, the kind of, if you look at the polarization of these photons, the kind of state you expect is something like the state shown here. So horizontal, horizontal plus vertical, vertical, which is an entangled state. And you can also turn it into something that looks even more like a singlet state by local operations. So it's no problem. What they have to do is they collect only the back-to-back -back, um, emitted pairs. We discussed this briefly that this is necessary to get this nice entangled photon state. Now, they did agree with the results of quantum mechanics. That was already very good. And they did violate a suitably modified Bell inequality, suitably modified in the sense that I explained that um, you are aware that, for example, your detectors are really uh, bad. So the detector efficiency, when you include also the fact that you only collect um, those photons really moving back to back, um, has been very tiny, 10 to the minus three in this experiment. Mm, the coincidence rate was one coincident photon pair every 10 seconds. And so they really collected data for 200 hours. So these were heroic uh, experiment, experiments. Nevertheless, they at least were in agreement with quantum mechanics. Now, there are many things that were not yet perfect. Among them, of course, uh, trying to impose this condition of locality to put them 
far enough apart and to measure them fast enough so that you can be certain that um, the setting from one detector did not have time to reach the other detector. And so that brings me to the next very important step in this historical evolution. And these are the experiments of Alan S.B. and collaborators in France in the beginning of the 1980s. Interestingly, that also uses an atomic cascade. So two photons emitted from a single atom. But in contrast to what came before, this was the first one to detect both polarization directions instead of just putting a polarizer in the beam path of the photons. And if it has the right polarization, it passes, but otherwise it's just discarded. So here you really detect both polarization directions and also the first to switch rapidly the measurement direction so that at least in principle, you could claim that you have fulfilled this locality condition that enters the Bell proof. So I'm showing the setup here. Uh, what I'm showing here is only half of the setup, say at the one of the detector stations. And so um, you see two things. You see how the rapid switching works and you see how uh, to detect both the polarization directions. For detecting both polarization directions, these are just polarizing beam splitters. We mentioned them briefly before. So say horizontal is um, transmitted and vertical is um, reflected. Either, uh, both of them can be detected using photo detectors. Um, so how does the rapid switching of the setting work? Well, in principle, you could presumably try to rapidly turn around this polarizing beam splitter here. So, so rapidly move this. But in, in actual practice, this is impossible. You cannot move this fast enough. And so what was the idea here is rather funny. You have two of these setups with a different orientation of the polarizing beam splitter. And then you just have to rapidly switch the path of the photons to go through either one of these two uh, detection devices. And how do you rapidly switch the path uh, of a light beam? Well, again, you could have a mirror that you uh, quickly uh, deflect. Uh, but what was done here was actually even smarter. So if you have a sound wave in some material, like water in this case, um, then you can have a beam of light being scattered off the sound wave. And as the sound wave oscillates, some uh, amplitude oscillating in time, actually also uh, you get different scattering. And so sometimes you get the beam path uh, going through the uh, upper arm as shown here and sometimes through the lower arm. So that was a, really a rapid switching. And I'll say something about how rapid these things were and what were the time scales. But there's one drawback, so to speak, and that's important to mention here. Uh, this was periodic switching, not truly speaking random. So the sound wave oscillations are obviously periodic. Okay, we will come back to that in a moment. But first, uh, let's have a look at the locality. So whenever we talk about locality, we like to draw space-time diagrams, just like this one. And this is the one that is relevant for the LNS Bay experiment. So you would have um, a distance L between the two measurement stations that if you convert it back into a time of flight of a light signal would be 40 nanoseconds. And 40 nanoseconds um, is larger than 10 nanoseconds, which is important because 10 nanoseconds is really the detection time window. So from uh, setting, choosing the settings until uh, finishing the detection. And so what that means is just as we discussed before, there is no way the detector B could learn about the setting of detector A in time to influence the measurement result at B, simply because the signal would arrive too late. So in principle, you have the first uh, experiment with true locality fulfilled with the slight caveat uh, that you don't have this desired random switching, but instead have periodic switching which is of course a problem because you could come up with the idea, well, if it's periodic, then I can predict uh, ahead of time what will be the setting. And so uh, this idea that um, I, 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 I do not know what the other detector setting will be is maybe flawed in this case. Okay. So 
I pause here maybe if there is already a question about this rather famous experiment. So first time uh, true locality, first time detecting both polarizations. But everything from atomic cascades, so in that sense, uh, similar to Friedman and Clauser. Okay, so this was atomic cascade. I mentioned another way. Ah, okay. Um, so the, if you have, so the, the questions are, okay, what about this problem that I pointed out uh, that the switching is periodic? Well, you see um, all this business about a light signal not being able to reach the other detector in time, that makes sense because uh, this is something we discuss simply because we want to make sure that um, in Bell's inequalities, the outcome at say detector B should only depend at, should only depend on the hidden variable lambda and the detector setting at B, but it should never ever depend on the detector setting at A. And this could of course be violated if a light signal would have time to travel from A to B so that B could learn about the detector setting at A. Now, however, if you have periodic switching going on in both detectors, then in principle, I don't need to know what is the current detector setting at this given current time. I just need to know what was the detector setting um, some time ago, because after all the settings change periodically. So I can, so to speak, extrapolate what, will, what would be the setting now, even if a light signal has not yet reached me. So that's at least the idea why periodic switching is not so good. Okay, and uh, here there was another question about the setup. Yeah, what happens here is really that the direction changes. So let's say in, in one time interval, photons will be scattered into the upper arm and then hit a polarizing beam splitter and be detected by either one of the detectors. And a little while later, uh, scattering takes you down to the lower arm where the polarizing beam splitter has been rotated into a different direction, and then you're detected there. So instead of rapidly rotating the polarizing beam splitter, you just rapidly send the photon once to the upper and once to the lower arm. That's the idea. Oh, the goal with rapid switching, in ideally the goal with rapid switching is if it were also truly random, uh, that you can actually make sure that the um, time interval during which the detector setting is constant um, is really very small because if this time interval during which the detector setting is constant and the measurement is carried out becomes longer and longer, if these 10 nanoseconds become 100 nanoseconds and 1000 nanoseconds, then of course at a given distance between A and B, you cannot make sure that uh, you don't reach detector B in time with your light signal. So it's very important that this time window, which is here 10 nanoseconds between uh, setting the uh, detector and measuring that this is fairly short. And one simple way to do this is if you can really rapidly switch maybe every 10 nanoseconds or so between different uh, detector settings. Oh yeah, so there's another interesting question. The interaction with the water, uh, what about it? Uh, could it be viewed as another measurement? Well, that's actually a good question. Uh, if you set this up under the wrong circumstances, then indeed it could happen that a photon being scattered from water would actually launch a sound wave and leave behind a sound wave, a phonon. And in this case, of course, it would have left behind a trace and that could be dangerous for the coherence of the quantum state. Um, but here, actually, the interaction is exceedingly weak and so you have to really excite a strong sound wave in the water, which consists of many, many phonons, and so can be considered almost like a classical state. And so then the interaction is in a sense only one way. So the sound wave will do something to the light, but the light will not do much to the sound wave because the sound wave is so strong. And then we don't have a problem in this direction. Uh, was the switching period of A and B different uh, actually, very good question. I don't remember. I do think it was, but, but I simply don't remember. 
Okay, maybe someone can look this up about the periods. Okay, good, very good. So then maybe let's move on. So this was an atomic cascade experiment. I mentioned that another way to get entangled photons is parametric down conversion. So the first experiments on using parametric down conversion for Bell tests were quite early in the 1980s and they were also quite simple in a sense. So they were using a kind of parametric down conversion that in principle just produces two horizontally polarized photons. The situation is shown here. And of course, that's a little bit boring because then at least you don't have any entanglement in the um, polarization. What they then put is an optical element that switches the polarization from say horizontal to vertical. So the photon that travels onwards is now polarized vertically, but still it would be very boring because in terms of polarization, it would just be a product state. Now, the little trick they play is they send this product state through a beam splitter, which is a famous trick in quantum optics because then you can do a lot of interesting things. So what happens after the beam splitter is you still in principle have a product state, but now each part of the product state looks like this, where partially it is reflected, that's what the R stands for with a certain amplitude R, and partially it is transmitted through the beam splitter, so amplitude T. Uh, and the same for, um, and the same for the second part of the wave function. So it's still a product state, but it now has uh, several different components. And so interestingly, among all of these components, you have also, if, if you carry out the product, you get, of course, four terms. You, in particular, have terms where the two photons end up in different detectors, one and two, yeah? So for example, you have H1, B2, horizontal in one, a vertical in two, and the other way around. And now you can do the following. You can uh, place detectors at one and two, and you only record the events where both detectors click. So one clicks and two clicks. So you know uh, you are accessing uh, this kind of state. So something like H1, B2 plus V1, H2. And if you only post select for these states, uh, then indeed uh, you're talking about an entangled state and you will find the statistics that you expect for this state. But it's a little bit cumbersome and you need this post selection. And also, of course, the efficiencies were bad and everything. So that's why it was extremely important that in 1995, people invented a new source of parametric down conversion photons. Depending on what you do in terms of um, how you align the polarization and which crystal you use and from which angle you come onto the crystal, you can have different types of parametric down conversion. And this was a particular type where indeed immediately you get two different polarizations, horizontal and vertical. And if you then select the photons only coming in particular, emanating in particular directions like one and two, uh, you automatically get the state that is displayed here, which is automatically an entangled state without any post selection. So this was much better, also much higher efficiency. And that uh, was the source that enabled so many additional experiments. Okay, so what was the experiment? What is the probably earliest famous experiment that was enabled by this source? Well, that's in 1998, the Zeilinger group um, implementing the first Bell test that not only had space-like separation, Alana Spe already had that, uh, but also had independent, truly random settings. So nothing periodic, nothing that could, pre could be predicted in any way. And so in order to achieve the space-like separation, they really had a large distance having um, uh, beams going across the campus with 400 meters separation. If you convert that into a light um, travel time, it is 1.3 microseconds. And what was the random number generator? Well, that's also interesting. They took uh, not say one of those random number generators you, your computer has built in, but they took an actual physical random number generator. So they sent light onto a beam splitter and sometimes uh, the photons pass, uh, then they go through in this detector and you count this maybe as a zero 
And sometimes the photon is reflected and you count this as a one. So if you have a 50-50 beam splitter, you expect zero and one with 50-50 probability. And for all we know, this is truly random. And again, you would very have a rapid sequence of random bits from this physical random number generator. And you use that uh, to switch the polarizations. And so uh, the total measurement time includes more than just these 10 nanoseconds used to switch to the next setting, uh, but it's still less than 100 nanoseconds. And you compare that against the one microsecond light travel time. So you can be really safe that no signal from the other detector has reached you by that time. What has to be said is that the detection and collection efficiency were quite significantly better than what had gone on before, but still on the 5% range. So this is still not perfect and we will come back to that. So that's a limitation. Another very interesting thing I want to mention is that if you have these two different measurement stations, you just get a long stream of measurement results. But afterwards, you want to compare them with the results at the other measurement station. And so they really had to, they really had to time tag the events. So they had independent atomic clocks at the two stations and would then give time tags and later find out, maybe calibrate what's the time delay. And then they would be able to identify, aha, this event here at station A, that must belong to the same corresponding event at station B. So that's uh, really important. OK. Um, so someone makes the following remark uh, concerning the physical random number generator. Uh, the remark made here is that it's still a deterministic machine. Well. Uh, it depends a little bit. We would, we would think um, that somehow we would think that uh, such a physical process is truly random. Uh, we have no indications that it is not uh, truly random. Um, but of course, in principle, there exists this possibility, and we will discuss it at the end of today's lecture, uh, that somehow everything was predetermined, including what you think is this random random number generator and what it does. And in that case, uh, you run into a problem that you cannot really completely resolve. You can only make it less and less likely. So you can make, um, you can use other sources of randomness. So it becomes an ever more fantastical story if you suppose that somehow uh, the two uh, random settings at both sides are correlated because they had, because they are somehow influenced by something that happened uh, to both of them in the past. So the what you mentioned cannot be maybe completely excluded, but it can be made to sound more and more crazy. But so to speak, on the lowest order level, uh, if we don't think in these terms of um, loopholes then we would just say, um, this is the best physical random process uh, we have for all we know. Okay. So now, um, yeah, I was just explaining these events are time tagged and compared later uh, with a computer. So, so to speak, you make a logbook for each of the measurement stations and only later you start to compare them. And when you do compare them, when they did this comparison, they found that uh, they are nicely reproducing what you would expect from quantum mechanics. So we know that in quantum mechanics, for example, if I insert into the CHHS uh, inequality, and I would get a two square root of two, whereas uh, local hidden variable theories would be bounded by two, and they are way off from that. And I depicted uh, schematically uh, what it means when people say, we violated the Bell inequality by 30 standard deviations. So what that means is you not only put your measurement result where it is, hopefully close to the result uh, predicted by quantum mechanics, but you also put the statistical error bars and then you compare these error bars against the, um, the boundary uh, that describes local hidden variable theories. And then you can say, oh, I'm off from this boundary by 30 standard deviations. So it is very, very unlikely that uh, me measuring this large value that is so far off from 
the boundary is just a statistical uh, fluctuation. It's probably true, it's real. Okay, so in that experiment, according to uh, general consensus, they really completely closed the locality loophole, including um, independent true randomness. Uh, but as I pointed out, the detectors were not yet quite that good. So uh, detection efficiency um, is a problem and this loophole is not closed. Okay, so let's move on to another experiment a few years later, where actually the detection loophole was closed, unfortunately, not at the same time with the locality loophole. So what was that experiment? Well, so one uh, system where it is fairly easy to measure very, very reliably is atoms because you can measure them by scattering laser light and you can scatter a lot of light and then be very certain about the state of the atom. So the experiment in question here was actually done in an iron trap with two trapped ions. Uh, we'd, we briefly mentioned iron traps before because they are nowadays a very uh, popular platform for qubits. Um, and when you have these two ions um, inside, inside a trapping potential, in this case at three micrometer distance, uh, there is some interaction between them, which is simply the Coulomb interaction. On the other hand, what you would like to entangle is the internal spin. And at first glance, the spin is not affected by the Coulomb interaction. So at first glance, there shouldn't be any entanglement going on. However, you can employ laser fields and these laser fields, on the one hand, they can control the spin. For example, they can flip the spin if you do it in the right way. But their action can also be influenced by the motion. And the motion, in turn, can be influenced by the Coulomb interaction. And so putting all of these ingredients together by applying a clever laser pulse sequence, you can indeed produce something like, say, a singlet state in the spins of the ions. So this is how these ions get entangled. The more important part is maybe how are they measured because this is where the advantage of the ions comes into play. So what they do is use so-called resonance fluorescence. So imagine this level scheme that I sketched here. Um, this level scheme is sketched here. And um, there, would be two in there would be two internal states, one that you identify with spin down and the other with spin up. These are the states that also then are used for the entanglement. Uh, and now it turns out that you can very, very reliably measure whether the ion is in the downspin state. And the way you do it is you send in a laser and this laser has to be resonant with the transition, with a transition between the say downspin state and um, some upper level state. And what happens is the laser excites you to the upper level and then as you fall down to the lower level, a photon gets re-emitted, but goes off maybe in a different direction. So you scatter these photons. You scatter many, many photons if you illuminate long enough with a laser. And you can see that in a sense, the iron looks bright because it scatters many photons. If on the other hand, you are currently residing in the other level, the up state, then the incoming laser is not in resonance with any transition because this up state is sitting at a different energy. So it's not in resonance with any transition. So you don't scatter any photons. So, so the ion appears dark. So this is the secret of measurement via resonance fluorescence. And that's very efficient because look, if you get 60 photons scattered, even if you lose a few of them, it doesn't really matter. You still get 50 photons and you are still very sure that your ion had been in the down state. So this really closed the detection loophole. On the other hand, of course, you look at this distance, three micrometer, and you can already guess that the locality loophole is wide open because there's no way that you can make this measurement fast enough such that a light signal could not travel from one of the ions to the other ion to tell it what was uh, the detector setting in a way. So locality loophole still open. And now we are slowly moving forward in the story because the goal now is obvious. Yeah, you want to close the detection and the locality loophole at the same time. And again, to close the locality loophole 
in some way or another, probably you want large distances and the best way to transfer quantum information over last, large distances are optical photons. So photons will be involved. Now, the detection loophole, that's another matter. We already saw one way is to involve, let's say atoms and use something like resonance fluorescence um, to manipulate them and detect their state. And that was really one path that people took. Uh, and the other is just to make better photo detectors. So let me first turn to the better photo detectors. So it turns out that, well, photon detectors are extremely important uh, in many applications. So people were working hard on, on them. And so say a few years ago, photon detectors came up with a detection efficiency of larger than 90%. So just because the physics is nice, um, I can briefly explain how they work. You have a superconductor, a superconductor nanowire, let's say. And then if a photon hits the superconductor, it will heat locally uh, the material, the metal. Because it's heated, it goes above the superconducting transition temperature. So suddenly it becomes a normal metal, which has an electrical resistance. Because it has a resistance and there's a current being passed through it, a voltage develops and even more heating occurs because of the ohmic resistance. So there's a sudden pulse of uh, heat and resistance and also a voltage pulse that results from it, which you can then measure. So it's a very smart way to, um, to detect photons and it has a very high detection efficiency. And so once these became available, it became clear that you should try doing uh, new Bell test experiments with those. And so this is what happened in 2015. There were even two different teams involved in this effort. Actually, the person supplying the detector is on both these papers. Um, I mentioned a few numbers about these uh, teams. So in both cases, they have these usual entangled photons from parametric down conversion and the superconducting detectors. Um, Total detection, when, when it says, for example, total detection efficiency here, what it means is that you not only count what the detector does, but also how reliably uh, you can get the photons to where you want them to be. So the collection efficiency and so on. So total detection efficiency, 75%. And it turns out that was just borderline at the threshold where you could then um, reliably violate a Bell inequality without any extra assumptions. What I also want to mention already on this, uh, on this side is uh, they took not only one, but they took three different random number generators. So they got randomness from fluctuations of a laser. Lasers are not completely entirely stable. Um, photon detection of the sort of uh, running a photon through a beam splitter. And then a completely different source of randomness, namely data from movies and TV shows and digits of pi. And they took all of them together. So they took all the three bits that they extracted and took an XOR uh, to combine all these sources of randomness. And we will come back a little bit later to why it would be smart or funny to do this. And it really has to do with the question you just asked. Uh, what about if I don't believe that you are really random and so on? Okay, and uh, likewise, the Vienna team, the distance was a little bit different, but um, they did a very careful analysis of uh, what is the probability that you could still explain the observations even under the assumption that you have a local hidden variable theory, simply because you would claim, oh, this is all statistical fluctuations. And the probability that you have this way out is, well, smaller than 10 to the minus 30. So it's basically non-existent. So both of these really close the detection loophole uh, and the locality loophole at the same time, finally. So that was a big breakthrough. But these were interestingly not the first experiments to close both of these loopholes at the same time. There was another experiment somewhat earlier this year. And it's so interesting, I also want to explain it in some more detail. So there's an interesting principle that was even suggested by John Bell himself uh, early on. Um, what you can do if you have a situation where 
sometimes particles get lost and sometimes the entanglement doesn't quite work and so on. What you can do, logically speaking, is the following. You build some kind of device, which is shown here in the middle, whose purpose is simply to tell you when have you been successful in creating the entanglement. Sometimes it is possible to tell that now I have been successful, now both my particles have been entangled. If you can build such a device, that's very good because you just wait until this device uh, signals that, oh, now is the time, now A and B have been in, in an entangled state. And then you carry out your measurement and you uh, detect the outcome both at A and at B. So just sitting there waiting, 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 many attempts at entanglement generation fail, but once it succeeds, you know, oh, now I should uh, take serious uh, the outcomes and the settings. Okay, so that's one ingredient. Um, there's another ingredient uh, used in this uh, experiment. And since we didn't discuss this so far, I also want to discuss it briefly. And that's a technique called entanglement swapping. Now, uh, imagine that you have not just two, but four different spins, let's say, or four different photons, or maybe a mixture of photons and spins. Anyway, four different parties that can, in principle, get entangled. And imagine that uh, initially you prepared them such that what I hear called capital A and alpha, these two um, physical systems are entangled, and capital B and beta are also entangled. Now, it turns out there's a very clever scheme, and we will discuss it in a minute, where you would perform a joint measurement of alpha and beta, and I'll say more precisely what a joint measurement is. You carry out a joint measurement of alpha and beta, and depending on the result, it may happen that you find alpha and beta are now entangled after the measurement. And at the same time, capital A and capital B are entangled. So it's called entanglement swapping because suddenly the entanglement is uh, no longer with the original parties that are entangled, but with different parties that have gotten entangled. So now, um, how does this work in, in more detail? Well, um, the initial state that I depict here is obviously one where capital A and alpha are entangled and capital B and beta are entangled, but there's nothing in between them. So it's a product state uh, of a state that only relates to A and alpha and another state that only relates to B and beta. How do these product states look like? Well, in the simplest case, assume you have a singlet state in each of these cases. So psi A alpha is our famous singlet state. Now, what you want to do is a joint measurement. What is a joint measurement? It doesn't just mean that you measure alpha and beta independently, because that would actually be an extremely bad idea. It will collapse you to a product state, a non-entangled state, and you would have destroyed everything, actually. Uh, what a joint measurement means is that uh, somehow you are able to tell, for example, whether alpha and beta are a singlet state or some other interesting two particle state, but you don't know the individual spin direction of alpha and beta. And any such measurement uh, relies on having something like an interaction between these two particles or at least bringing them together. And if these were real electrons uh, or real material particles with a spin that goes along with a magnetic moment, you could even think uh, of things like measuring the total magnetic moment of the two spins together. And if you find it to be zero, then you know, oh, they are in a, a S equals zero state, meaning the singlet state. So that would be a joint measurement. You cannot resolve the individual spins, but you know something about the total spin. Okay. Anyway, there are many different techniques for joint measurements, but it requires some work. Now, if you do detect them in the singlet state, if you do detect alpha and beta in this joint measurement in the singlet state, what does this mean? How do you even proceed from there? And uh, we already know the initial state that was psi. And we also know in principle what to do if someone tells us, I have measured this state, I have uh, found in my measurement the following outcome. What we have to do is 
Um, if the outcome consists in having observed a certain state, then you take the projector onto this state and um, apply it uh, to the original state. So in our case, if we claim that we have detected alpha and beta in the singlet state, then we should presumably apply the projector onto the singlet state on our original state psi. And if we do this and go through a few lines of math, but nothing very complicated, then we find that, aha, after the measurement, well, we are of course in the singlet state with respect to alpha and beta. This is what we already said, this is not surprising. But if we collect all the terms that relate to A and B, all the rest of the terms, then we find this is also a singlet state. And you could likewise go through other combinations where instead of having a singlet state, you have say one of the triplet uh, states and so on. So um, you would find then different combinations. But in any case, by having done this joint measurement on alpha and beta and observing a certain outcome, suddenly you learn something about, suddenly you find that A and B are now in an entangled state, even if they have never interacted with each other. That's the idea. Okay, so that's entanglement swapping in a nutshell for you. Again, it helps if you practice this a little. Um, but now I can summarize the experiment, the first uh, loophole-free Bell test experiment that came out a few months before the others. What they did was use a combination of photons and material particles with spin. And so uh, this is actually due to the Hansen group uh, in Delft. What they had was two systems that contain a spin and these systems are nowadays quite famous in the field of, say, quantum computation and communication. These are spins inside diamond. In diamond, if you place a nitrogen atom inside diamond and it's next to a vacancy, so a missing carbon atom, uh, then it turns out uh, this is like a little, well, like a little atom with its electronic orbitals in its own right. It's called an impurity because it shouldn't be there, but it is there. And it has a spin. And this spin, with this spin, you can play all kinds of tricks. You can manipulate it with laser fields and with microwaves. And what they were able to do, and I don't want to go into every detail, what they were able to do is to entangle the spin with a photon. So this spin state here is now at first entangled with a photon. And I call the photon alpha and the spin capital A, so you know where this is going. Likewise, they have another little piece of diamond, one kilometer apart, where again they entangle its spin uh, with an outgoing photon beta that is released. And now the funny thing is, um, if you send uh, alpha and beta through a beam splitter and uh, measure them, you can conclude from the measurement that alpha and beta have been entangled and in the spirit of entanglement swapping, also the original spins capital A and capital B have been entangled. So uh, what this means for us is once you do detect the photons uh, in these detectors, so uh, one here and one there, uh, then you know at this point in time, you suddenly know, oh, my spins are in the singlet state. I have been successful. And the fact that you're losing many photons on the way is only half bad. It is still bad because it uh, reduces the rate at which these entangled states are uh, properly created. So that's bad, of course, because you have to wait longer. But whenever you do create an entangled state, because both photons do reach the detectors, uh, then you can be certain that it's, that it's really an entangled state. And so this uh, brings us to this event-ready detection. So many, many times uh, the attempt at creating entanglement may fail, for example, because photons get lost on the way. But if it succeeds, you know for sure. And if it succeeds, then you know you should take a serious your measurement results. Okay. So now um, I, I said there, there is a catch. And the catch is that indeed many photons got lost on the way. So if you then only keep the events where you have successfully generated entanglement, they got only one event per hour. So this is a terribly small rate. And so they had then uh, to wait many, many, many hours in order to collect sufficient statistics. 
So again, this was truly the first that closed both loopholes, uh, but uh, it was quite an effort. Okay, are there questions about this, about these three experiments for right now? So these experiments made quite, quite a splash back in 2015 because it had been such a long story since 1964 when Bell came out with the Bell inequality. But these experiments really then closed the story. Now, I want to come back to something you mentioned. You were a little bit skeptical um, about the random number generator, what happens there. And indeed, uh, people uh, share the skepticism because if you look back even at the original, um, okay, so there's another question, maybe before I go to the freedom of choice loophole, uh, I should answer this question. Will you not destroy entanglement of spins by measuring photons? No, that's the funny thing um, that goes back to this idea. Um, if you did measure the photons alpha and beta individually, yes, you would project everything into a product state and completely destroy the entanglement. Uh, but here you are detecting the photons jointly in a joint state that is actually an entangled photon state and thereby you are creating also this entanglement between A and B. So, so it's extremely important that there is this joint measurement. So what um, really happens here, maybe I now say something about the details is the uh, spin state is actually entangled with the, with the time bin of the photon, whether it comes early or late. And then what happens is when you send these photons on the beam splitter, you may detect something like one detector detects an early photon, the other detector detects a late photon. So that's what you are looking for. But since they went through a beam splitter, you cannot tell which was which. Did the early photon come from A or from B? And did the late photon come from A or B? And then if you go through the math, you find that there are two possibilities that are consistent with this outcome and they are coherently superimposed and they produce your entangled state. Okay, good. But now I come back to the, to the big remaining question about uh, Bell uh, experiments. So to speak, you are, let's say you are someone who really likes local hidden variable theories and doesn't want to give up so easily. Then what you should be looking for is of course, any reason why maybe Bell's idealized assumptions are still not quite fulfilled in the experiments. And when you go carefully through uh, the derivation of Bell's inequality, even Bell himself mentions, it's important that the settings are truly independent and random. They are arbitrary. They, are, they can be changed by the experimenter. There's nothing that predetermines them because that would be catastrophic. And so now if you really like hidden variable local hidden variable theories, you could conjecture that, well, maybe these settings are not truly random. Maybe they are not independent of the uh, local hidden variable. Maybe they have been predetermined sometime in the past and it just looks to me as if I have a random number generator, but everything was already decided a long time ago. And so, so to speak, both detectors and the source that emits my particles, they have all been influenced uh, by uh, the same things long in the past, then of course anything could be possible again. So um, let's go through this one by one. I should say in advance, you cannot, you cannot completely rule out this kind of thinking, but you can make it appear less and less appealing, more and more strange, so to speak. Now let's first uh, discuss the more straightforward things. So one thing that is certainly true is uh, in all of these experiments, you have somehow the source that emits the pair of photons or something. And you would think that, aha, uh -huh, so if I conjecture that somehow together with this pair of particles, my magical uh, hidden variable is emitted, some magical field that I don't even have access to and that is hidden as the name says, but still something is going on, something extra, then couldn't it be that this hidden field in the background also 
magically influences my detector settings. So I think they are random, but in reality, they are being influenced by lambda as well. And this would be a situation that is not covered by the logic of Bell's inequalities when the detector settings actually start to depend on lambda. So what people did in some of the modern experiments is they made sure that um, if you assume you know relatively well the moment of pair emission and you assume that it is then that lambda comes into existence and can only travel with the speed of light because it's a local hidden variable, uh, then you make sure that the little time interval during which you choose your random setting um, is space-like separated from the moment of pair emission. In other words, it cannot be influenced yet uh, by the local hidden variable lambda that may be created together with the pair. So this uh, random setting is independent of that. So this is the simplest thing to take care of by proper, by making sure that uh, everything is aligned properly in time. Now, this, however, gives you only a little bit of respite because someone could say, uh, as we just said before, well, well, no, no, I don't necessarily believe that it is lambda, the hidden variable that is created while the pair is created and then influences the detectors. No, no, I assume that everything has been predetermined long in the past. And so both detectors and their seemingly random settings have been predetermined by something uh, and maybe lambda has been predetermined by the same uh, sources. So um, whenever you talk about this what influences what in, uh, in physics and the notion of locality. Again, we have to draw space-time uh, diagrams. And so I show one here. Uh, this is the emission event in the middle. These are um, the little time intervals where you choose your seemingly random setting. And now uh, these random settings, like you throw a coin, for example, if you like, uh, they can, in principle, of course, have been influenced by everything in their so-called past light cone. So anything that can have reached them with a speed of light or slower speed. And so I've drawn these past light cones for you. So there's one past light cone for this detector setting, one past light cone for the other detector setting. Then if you like, also one past light cone uh, for the emission of the source. And in, in particular, in this area, you have events in the past that could, in principle, have influenced both the detector settings. And this is an argument that is on its face impossible to beat, but you can make it sound more and more ridiculous because somehow, you, if you are really trying to save local hidden variable theories, you would then have to come up with plausible physical mechanisms by which some funny um, events uh, that happened back here really truly influence um, both your detector settings. And people have gone to great lengths to make this appear more and more ridiculous. And so the way to do this is to obtain randomness from unconventional sources, not your little um, random number generator in the computer or this physical uh, random number generator. Um, that is maybe a local device uh, and who knows how it works, but they have produced randomness by feeding in bits from movies or, or uh, bits generated by people playing computer games. And then you would have to come up with something that sounds like a conspiracy theory that somehow these random bits from these, so to speak, cultural events like movies uh, would somehow conspire in such a way uh, so as to give you the right statistics. It's, it's very, it gets very, very weird if you go down this way. Um, another, another thing you can do is, and it's, it's particularly weird because these movies, of course, have been produced some time ago. So somehow everything is connected to the past. And you can make it even more weird by pushing, by pushing these points in time when the random signal was generated back and back in time. So with movies, maybe they were uh, 10 years back in time. And uh, what people found is that if they take these random events to be the emission of photons from far away 
stars or galaxies or other sources, then you can push them back in time even further. And so this is a recent experiment where they took light from distant uh, quasars actually to determine the settings. So I want to go through this a little bit. Here in the middle, you have your standard, you have your standard setup, right? So uh, this is your standard um, Bell test setup. But now instead of doing the random number generation somehow locally at each of these um, measurement stations, what you do is you detect the light that has reached you from a distant quasar and you detect, for example, its frequency and whether it's a little bit larger or smaller than some uh, threshold. And depending on that, you choose the polarizer uh, orientation. And you do it in such a way that the light uh, that has reached you from this quasar source at A cannot yet have reached B because of the ways uh, they are arranged and the light travel times. So it seems you have really completely independent random sources from different pieces of the universe. And uh, since, these, since this light has been emitted billions of years ago, you would then have to say, oh yes, but everything was somehow correlated back in time, just so that several billion years later, someone who's doing a Bell test uh, is getting fooled in thinking, oh yes, I have ruled out local hidden variable theories, but in reality, it was only because uh, the random settings were not truly random, but it predetermined uh, billions of years ago in just the right way. So this is how you try to make this kind of thinking less and less plausible. Okay, so are there any questions about this? Okay. Well, if I don't see any question right now, I would like to go on. So I've taken you through all of this history of, uh, so it seems that the problem is closed. Well, I think there will probably still be um, experiments ongoing, but then they will probably look into, into different aspects. For example, applications of this. Um, if you have devices that uh, can produce these entangled uh, pairs that uh, produce uh, violations of Bell inequalities, uh, then the violation of the Bell inequality somehow tells you that the entanglement is very strong, otherwise it wouldn't be violated. And so it can be used actually in areas like uh, quantum cryptography to make things device independent. You don't even need to know exactly how the entangled state is produced. Um, you just look at the results of Bell tests. You can be very sure that you have a very good entangled state. This is one of the possible applications. And people look into uh, not only two parties, but multiple parties, and we will come, come to that in a moment. But essentially, from the point of view of local hidden variable theories, unless someone finds a catch or a flaw in one of the arguments, then I would think, yes, uh, the issue is closed. Uh, if I mean, I have to confess that I found local hidden variable uh, theories uh, very attractive um, when I first looked into them. And uh, when I first looked into them, of course, um, both the detection, uh, at least the detection loophole was still open and the locality loophole had just uh, been closed. Um, so to some degrees, uh, some part of me liked to see that these loopholes would be somehow fundamental and it would turn out that local hidden variable theories are after all feasible, but I think uh, at least I have <laughs> lost all hope that this is so. Yeah. Even though local hidden variable theories coming from a normal physics background sound very plausible and appealing, just locality and that things exist before, uh, even before you measure them, uh, that doesn't seem to work. Okay, good, very good. So now I want to take a little bit of time telling you uh, something still about two very interesting pieces. One concerns what happens if we have three spins and the other will actually take us back to the original EPR idea and say something about that. Okay, so um, 
let's call this some further remarks. So this is con concluding the chapter on uh, Bell inequalities. Um, and the first thing I want to mention is so-called Greenberger horn seilingard states. These are the ones with three particles. Okay. So now uh, the state we are looking at is rather simple. It's really just up, 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 plus down, down, down. Very, very simple. Now you have three spins. And let me just introduce a, a abbreviation because I don't want to write too much. So for example, if I want to measure the sigma x of a spin number two, I will just write x2. So this is the same as sigma x2. It only acts on spin two. And for example, um, sigma x will flip a spin and sigma y uh, will also flip a spin, but uh, give an additional minus i or i. So, so these are the these are the things that we already know from the Pauli matrices. Okay, good, fine. And um, now let's try to apply the following string of operators. Let me apply x1 times x2 times x3 onto the psi state. Now you know what happens x1 flips spin number one, taking up into down, for example, x2 flips spin number two, and x3 flips spin number three. So the up, up, up will turn into down, 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 but the down, down, down will turn into up, up, up. And so nothing will change, actually. You recover the same state. So that was hopefully simple. You can also calculate what happens if you, say, apply twice a y type operator, sigma y, and once an x type operator. Now that requires a little bit more care, um, but it turns out that in the end you get minus psi, if you work it out. And so on, actually the, the second thing happens whenever you pair two y operators with one x operator in this game for this state. Um, now, let me, let me uh, choose notation where I would say, um, now I start to measure these operators. So I measure x1 and I will call x1 the measurement result. So this is without the hat, without the operator. This is just the measurement uh, result when I measure the operator. So I measure the spin in the x direction, spin number one in the x direction. Um, and so if I make a little table, oh, maybe I should start this table on the next uh, slide because I need some more space. So I now want to make a little table. What are the measurement outcomes uh, for the different possible combinations that I could take? So I could, for example, measure x1 and x2 and x3, and I could simply take the product of the outcomes of the measurements. So this is not a product of operators. This is very simply uh, the product of the outcomes of the measurement. And so I can also note down what is the prediction of quantum mechanics for the given state. And now we just said that um, x1, x2, x3, if I apply all of them to the state psi, I recover state psi. So it's an eigenstate with eigenvalue plus one. So also if I really carry out all the measurements and take the product uh, of the outcomes, I should recover plus one. Okay. 
So I could, in principle, try a collective measurement, like really x1, x2, x3. But since all of them commute with each other, I can also really, and, and maybe I don't care whether the state gets destroyed, I can really individually measure x1, x2, x3, and uh, look at the outcome. And quantum mechanics predicts, if you take the product of these outcomes, you always get plus one. Now, what happens if I measure y1 and y2 and x3, and again, take the product of these outcomes? Well, uh, this little calculation that we did before tells me that I expect minus one. And you can also go through the calculation in more detail, say projecting one by one on, onto these outcomes and summing up everything. But either way you do it, you find minus one for this product, for this state. And then you go through all the combinations. So instead of doing x3, you do x2 or x1 and always fill up with y measurements. Okay, and according to the same algebra as before, you always find minus one. Okay, so that's our little table. Now, there's something very funny about this table, which may not be apparent at first sight, but it's a little bit funny in the same way that things were funny back when we discussed the uh, Merman version of the Bell's inequalities. Because let me assume now that I'm trying to describe this kind of experiment with a local hidden variable theory. So meaning in particular that these spins or these, these values of the potential measurement outcomes, they are real already before I actually do the measurement. So all of them have definite values, x1, y1, x2, and so on. They all have definite values even before I decide which measurement I want to do. And so now you can do the following. Uh, I gave you this little table uh, with the measurement combinations on the left-hand side. And what I want to do is take the product of all these four results. Now, if I take the product of these four results, so I have to multiply x1, x2, x3 with y1, y2, x3, uh, and then still two further um, brackets. It's not very difficult algebra to confirm that, say, x1 appears twice in this whole product. y1 also appears twice. So I get x1 squared, y1 squared, x2 squared, and so on. But then again, each of these measurement outcomes, in the ideal case at least, is either plus one or minus one. And if you square them, well, you get plus one, of course. So also the whole product will be plus one. So that's what a local hidden variable theory would predict. Uh, if, if I measure um, at spins one, two, or three, either X or Y, um, and I consider all these combinations, um, and I take the product of all of these outcomes of all of these products, then I should always get one. Now compare against quantum mechanics. Next. Quantum mechanics predicts that the product of these results is what? Well, we just have to look in our little table on the right hand side. We know that quantum mechanics predicts plus one for measuring the first product, minus one for the second one, minus one for the third, and minus one for the fourth. The product of all of these, oh, the product is minus one. So there couldn't be a bigger contradiction between quantum mechanics and local hidden variable models than this. So you have a situation where you don't even talk about statistics, at least at this point. You don't talk about statistics. You know that whenever you do uh, the measurements 
of say x1, x2, x3, and then take the product, the product is always plus one in quantum mechanics. That would be the outcome of the experiment. If you do the second line, the product would always be minus one. And then you take the product of all these results and you get completely different answers for local hidden variables in quantum mechanics. So it's even worse in a sense than the standard two particle bell inequality where you still had to look at these non-perfect correlations for different measurement angles. Um, here, it's even true if you only consider these cases where you have perfect uh, outcomes, perfect correlations. So there's a contradiction between quantum mechanics and local hidden variable theories here, even at the level of these uh, perfect definite results. Now, one thing needs to be said, you shouldn't think that you can completely get rid of statistics because if quantum mechanics predicts that you should always get plus one in order to confirm that you are close to this quantum mechanical prediction, of course, you need to do many experimental runs. You cannot just make one run, get plus one and say, see, see, I got quantum mechanics. So you need to have many, many runs and then maybe you see plus one in 99.999% of the cases. And so in that sense, you will still need many runs and still need to do a little bit of statistics. Still, there's this distinction that you don't even need to go to the cases where the correlations um, are not perfect, um, um, as in the usual Bell's inequalities. Here, you can uh, only consider the cases where the correlations are perfect. OK. Um, yeah, that's GHZ uh, for you. So these states are colloquially uh, referred to as GHZ states. Um, and they have many other interesting properties, uh, but that was quite a surprise back then. And by now, of course, experiments have been done using this. Okay, if there's no question here, then I want to finish the lecture today by going back to where we started, actually. So where we started was EPR, remember? So I want to come back to... Um, the original EPR experiment. Now, um, I may remind you that the kind of state you would be looking at could be something like, well, in the simplest case, say a delta function of x1 minus x2. So you have two particles uh, with position and momentum. And you assume you have been able to prepare such a state. Or more generally, you would uh, want to have a state where maybe it's not quite an ideal delta function, but at least it's a highly uh, peaked state. Now, the problem is there exist local hidden variable theories to describe the correlations between position and momentum measurements for such states. And that's a little bit surprising because all of this kickstarted the whole direction that then led to Bell inequalities. But it turns out, at least on the simplest level, you cannot violate Bell inequalities using uh, the original EPR idea. So, that sign means there exist local hidden variable um, models that uh, describe correctly for such states um, the X and P measurements and correlations. And um, the, the, the overall formal reason is that there actually exists a good probability density of both X and P, a joint probability density of X and P, which is a completely valid probability density, positive and so on, um, which is not normal in quantum mechanics. Normally you cannot assign this because otherwise quantum mechanics would be very much like classical physics. Normally you cannot take talk both of X and P simultaneously and assign a joint probability density. But for these kinds of states, more precisely for Gaussian, uh, the Gaussian class of states, it does work. And so uh, there's a little excursion 
here, um, which is the Wigner density, which is what you should know in this context. So maybe some of you might have taken a quantum map optics class, then you will suddenly have come across this. If not, don't worry. I can write down for you uh, how the Wigner density is defined. So the idea is to define something that looks like a probability density in phase space. So it will depend both on position and momentum. And we see which properties it shares with usual probability densities. But how do you get it? Well, you start from a wave function, from a quantum state. And then you do something funny. You take something like psi star psi, but instead of taking it at the same position, you take it at two different positions. And then you do a Fourier transform, but only in the relative coordinates, so the y here. So it looks a little bit complicated, but essentially the P is the Fourier variable that corresponds to Y. And of course, it, it's like a momentum. I mean, this is the momentum, the dimensions all add up the right way. You need some normalization, but that's it. Okay, so that looks funny, was invented by Wigner. Um, what are its properties? Well, the first property is you can show it's not obvious at first sight, but it's real valued. That's already good. Second property, it's normalized. Normalized meaning here, the kind of thing you expect for a normal probability density. So you, if you integrate over all of space, over all possible values of the variables, you should get one. So integral dx dp over two dimensional phase space is one. Um, Furthermore, if you want to know the probability density of finding the particle at position x, we know how to get this. This is just psi of x squared. But there's an alternative way to get this from the Wigner density. And that is just taking the Wigner density, integrating over all momenta, and leaving the x. And this is exactly what you would do if you have indeed a probability density of x and p, but you don't worry about the value of p, you just integrate over it. And what remains is the probability density in x. And likewise, if you look at the wave function in Fourier space, so I write a tilde, that is dependent on the momentum, it turns out that uh, you can obtain this by taking again the Wigner density, but now integrating over x. So everything, everything is quite nice. You can even go and calculate expectation values. For example, um, you can do something like this. Um, take the Wigner density, multiply it with some arbitrary function of x, and out comes what you would also alternatively have obtained if you take f of the operator x and then the expectation value in the original state. And likewise for P and there are more complicated constructions and so on. So everything looks very, very nice. There's just one catch, it can become negative. So that's the downside. If that were not the case, then probably no one would be working with the uh, wave function, but everyone would always be working with the Wigner density um, and treating it just like we treat probabilities, densities, and phase space and classical statistical physics. Now, one can draw the Wigner density for different interesting states. If you have, for example, the ground state of a harmonic oscillator, which is a Gaussian wave function, and you draw the Wigner density, it turns out that um, this, is, this is just a Gaussian in two dimensions. Yeah, So I try to draw a Gaussian two dimensions. So that's very easy. Um, if on the other hand, I have something like not the ground state of a harmonic oscillator, but say the first excited state of the harmonic oscillator, again, the wave function, of course, we know how it looks like. 
But the Wigner density has a very interesting appearance, um, which I hope I can um, somehow indicate. <laughs> There's something um, which has a kind of, it's like a little bit like a volcano that has a drop um, around the origin and it drops uh, actually to negative values. And so that's a telltale sign. Um, so this is the first Fox state. So this is the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. And this is the first uh, excited state of the harmonic oscillator. Um, that's a sign that you cannot play this game of saying, oh yeah, I know the statistics of X and P are just like in a classical phase space uh, probability density. They are not because it becomes negative. And now, um, now we can come back to our story with the EPR. The problem is that the kind of state that is produced here is can be seen as a Gaussian state. And the Gaussian state has a non-negative Wigner density. So everything looks very familiar. So Wigner densities of Gaussian states are, are non-negative. And so the correlations that you could measure in the EPR experiment, like if I measure X1, I know that uh, X2 is equal to that value. If I measure P1, I know that P2 is minus that value. These kinds of correlations can be then very, very easily understood um, by saying, yeah, of course, all of these correlations were already there in the Wigner density. In this case, you would talk about a Wigner density that depends on um, position and momentum of the first particle and of the second particle, but everything would look like a classical statistical problem. And so in EPR, you can, so for the EPR state, this would be non-negative. And in EPR, you could interpret everything, every outcome of the measurements and all the correlations and the statistics as uh, simply saying, oh, I have a local hidden variable model. Um, where the hidden variables are nothing but the actual values of x1 and p1 and x2 and p2. Of course, they are not very hidden, but they are still hidden in the sense that quantum mechanics would still tell you you cannot measure both of them at the same time. But you say, fine, sure, I'm not measuring them at the same time, but I imagine that they have existed and had definite values uh, before. and they would be distributed according to this Wigner density. So the only way out is really to, to use different states. Or to use different uh, kinds of measurements, of course, if you then say, oh no, I'm, I'm measuring actually a foc uh, photons, photon number, FOC uh, number or something like this, then again, things can change. But as long as you only measure X and P and you uh, retain the state with positive Wigner density, you cannot violate Bell's inequalities. Okay. And so now to finish this off, I still want to tell you about some more modest goal you can have in this context. And that would be to show not that you violate Bell inequalities, but at least confirm that the state is entangled. And so um, there's a very nice idea here, which I wanted to mention. So for EB EPR, for the ideal EPR, we know that x1 equals x2 always. So if I take the difference squared and average, it's just zero, they are always equal. And likewise, p1 and p2, well, they are not equal, but anti-equal. One has the opposite sign than the other. And so again, if I take the sum and then square, I always get zero in the ideal case. Um, 
Whereas if I have an uncorrelated state, say a product state, things are very different. If I calculate the same thing, I will just get something like x1 squared plus x2 squared, which is not at all zero. And likewise with p1 and p2, um, I will not get zero. And so the idea that people invented was to say, aha, I should just look at these correlators. So x1 minus x2 squared, this variance, and p1 plus p2 squared. If they are zero or close to zero, then it's probably going to be an entangled state. If they are very different from zero, then, well, maybe then I can't conclude anything. And so uh, this is what um, led to a famous sufficient criterion for entanglement which is due to Duan et al. in 2000. So uh, I just write down the simplest version. So consider the two variables where you have, say, the difference and uh, the sum, difference of positions, sum of momenta. And I assume for simplicity that we leave away the h bar. So x com commutator p is just i instead of i h bar. And, and then what they concluded is I should really look at uh, the variance of u. So essentially u squared after you subtract the average. Uh, And I should also look at the variance of V. And if I'm, if I find that this is large, then I cannot say anything. But if this inequality is violated, so the left-hand side is rather small, then it goes into the direction of EPR, we know, because then the left-hand side would be zero. Uh, then one can conclude, this is what they showed, uh, the state, the underlying state is entangled. For example, it might be an EPR state. So if the sum of the uh, variances that we just looked at is small enough, not maybe not so surprisingly, you go in the direction of EPR and you can at some point conclude that state is entangled. And so at least that was a kind of byproduct of all of this, but it's still very ironic, I think. And with that, I want to conclude that um, the original EPR, even though it was very fruitful, if someone like Bell had tried to look at it, he would just have concluded, oh yes, of course, there are local hidden variable theories. So it was very important for this e original EPR to turn into the into Bohm's version, which is the spin version, and that Bell then looked into the spin version and there Bell's inequalities can be derived. Okay, so much for today. So are there questions about this? Well, again, I want to remind everyone there are three very nice problems on the website and Wednesday at six o'clock we have a little tutorial explaining the solution to these problems. And then are there alternative density functions that are not negative? Well, there are, you can do, you can do things like, uh, for example, you can take a Wigner density and smear it out slightly. Uh, then it becomes, uh, then it cannot become negative but then it has different properties and then it will not, uh, then you cannot interpret it as a probability density for X and P because you will then make mistakes. For example, um, uh, if X um, has a very definite value, which it can have even in quantum mechanics at the expense of having P uh, being very smeared out. And then if you take this density and would smear it out, then you would get into and, and interpret the result still as a probability density, you would run into contradictions. So. It seems you never can quite have all the properties you want to have at the same time. That's the problem. 
Okay. So next time I still want to have one uh, final lecture before Christmas. And that's when we really start to look into measurement. I have skipped a few things um, that you are invited to read up in the lecture notes. So one can ask um, first, what are the typical applications of entanglement like quantum teleportation? So you can find a little bit in the lecture notes if you like. Um, so that's one thing to look into. And then you can also ask more generally mathematically about entanglement. How can we quantify how strongly states are entangled even beyond our interest in, in Bell's inequalities? And that's also an interesting topic in its own right, very, very wide topic. Again, you can find a little bit in the lecture notes so you can read up on that if you like. Okay, good, then that's it for today. Thank you very much.